This is the second of two presentations on overactive thyroid. The first was an introduction and the second talk is concentrating on the treatment options available specifically for Graves' disease, the most common cause of overactive thyroid. There are three main treatment options in Graves' disease. Tablets such as Carbimazole and PTU are used to bring thyroid hormone levels back down into the normal range, whilst another class of drug Beta blockers such as propanolol are sometimes used to control the symptoms of overactive thyroid such as tremor and palpitations. Radioiodine is typically given as a single capsule. This radioactive iodine is absorbed and taken up by the thyroid gland, thereby destroying the overactive thyroid tissue. Thyroid surgery involves an operation at the front of the neck to remove the thyroid gland. This is an effective treatment, but in most cases, tablets or radioiodine are considered first, with surgery reserved when these other treatments have not been effective or possible. Treatments can be divided into two categories. The first, definitive therapies, are ones which will almost certainly result in permanent underactive thyroid requiring lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. These include surgery and radioiodine. The second category, medication, includes carbimazole and PTU. These offer a small chance of coming off medication, but ultimately a greater than 70% chance of developing an overactive thyroid again in future. Moving on to discuss the tablet form of treatment first. Beta blockers are often prescribed when someone is first diagnosed with an overactive thyroid as they rapidly reduce symptoms such as palpitations, tremor and anxiety. They do not have a major effect on thyroid hormone levels and so are not used alone. People receiving tablet treatment, radioiodine or surgery can all be treated with beta blockers. The most common example of this medicine is called propranolol. One word of caution is that beta blockers should not be used in asthma as they can affect breathing in people suffering from this condition. The most common tablet form of treatment used to bring thyroid hormone levels down is carbimazole, although in some situations another drug in the same family, PTU, is used. These drugs typically reduce thyroid hormone levels within weeks. We would tend to treat people with a 12 to 18 month course of tablets, starting with a large dose and gradually bringing this down as thyroid hormone levels normalise. Whilst on this medication, we typically review people in clinic every two to three months initially, but the follow-up interval can extend out to four to six monthly, once on a low dose with stable thyroid hormone levels. After 12 to 18 months of treatment, we recheck TRAB antibody levels, which are a marker of how active the Graves' disease is. If the levels remain high, we would typically recommend remaining on treatment, as in this situation the risk of the thyroid becoming overactive immediately is very high off treatment. If these antibody levels are low, however, we would often consider stopping treatment. Carbimazole is a well-tolerated drug, but like all medications, is associated with some potential side effects. Around 6% of patients experience a rash on carbimazole. Damage to the liver is rare and typically mild and reversible. An even rarer but potentially serious side effect is a large reduction in the white blood cell count. White blood cells are a key part of the body's response to fighting infections and when their levels fall substantially there is an increased risk of severe infection. This side effect occurs in fewer than 1 in 300 people. It is more likely in older individuals and with larger doses of the drug. We always suggest that patients on carbimazole or PTU should seek an urgent blood test if they develop a sore throat or fever. Carbimazole is associated with an increased risk of birth defects when used in the early stages of pregnancy. For this reason, women planning pregnancy are often advised to use PTU, which has a slightly lower risk of birth defects. PTU use has a very small risk of liver failure in adults, around 1 in 10,000, which is one of the reasons why we do not use PTU as the first choice medication in all people with Graves' disease. Alternatively, permanent cure of thyrotoxicosis with radioiodine could be considered, but pregnancy in this situation must be delayed for six months. Another option would be surgical cure. It's important to avoid uncontrolled overactive thyroid, as this increases the risk of pregnancy loss. As mentioned earlier, after a 12-18 to 18 month course of treatment, consideration is given to stopping carbimazole. This is typically when thyroid hormone levels are in the normal range, antibody levels are very low or undetectable, and the patient has been on a very low dose of carbimazole, typically 5 mg. Although there's a chance of having long-term normal thyroid function after this, the majority of people will have a relapse of overactive thyroid in the future. 
In some cases it may be advisable to keep going with a long-term low dose of carbimazole. This graph plots the time to relapse of overactive thyroid in 184 Edinburgh patients who'd stopped the medication. Along the bottom horizontal line is the time in months in stopping carbimazole, and down the vertical line is the percentage of people who still have normal thyroid function having come off the tablet. In an ideal world, this graph would look like the red line, everyone still has normal thyroid function over four years of follow-up. In reality, the blue line is what happens. By the end of four years, 7 out of 10 people have had a relapse of overactive thyroid. Most of these relapses occur within the first two years. If at the point your overactive thyroid was diagnosed, your TRAB antibody levels were over 12, represented by the beige line here, the chances of relapsing off medication are 84%, whereas the risk is around 60% if TRABs were less than 5 at diagnosis, as shown by the blue line. High TRABs at the beginning means a 60% chance of relapse at one year. Low TRABs at the beginning means a 30% chance of relapse at one year after having stopped tablets. By the end of the treatment course, we check TRAB antibody levels again, sometime between 12 and 18 months after the treatment course was started. If at this stage they're undetectable, as shown in the blue line, the risk of relapse in the next four years is about 58%. But if they're above the normal range, as shown by the red line, the risk is over 80%. At the end of treatment, the low TRAB group have a one-year risk of overactive thyroid returning of 30%, but if the TRABs are high, this risk is 60%. To summarise this in simple terms, where the smiley faces are people not requiring any treatment and the sad faces are people who've had a recurrence of an overactive thyroid, High TRAB antibody levels at the start and end of treatment mean a 5 out of 10 risk of relapse at one year and a 9 out of 10 risk of relapse at four years. On the other hand, low TRABs at the start of treatment and at the end of treatment carries a 3 out of 10 risk of relapse at one year and a 6 out of 10 risk of relapse over four years. The best case scenario here is a 4 out of 10 chance of remaining off treatment. For most people, however, it's considerably higher than this. Moving on now to radioiodine. Radioiodine treatment has been used over the last 70 years to treat overactive thyroid and is known to be well tolerated with minimal side effects. It is not suitable where pregnancy is planned within six months and cannot be used during pregnancy. The treatment itself involves taking a single capsule by mouth. Radioiodine works by destroying overactive thyroid tissue and typically thyroid hormone levels fall within the first 48 weeks. Over the last few years in Edinburgh, 78% of people receiving radioiodine become hypothyroid and are therefore on thyroid hormone tablets within a year of treatment. This is the goal of radioiodine treatment. 7% of people at the end of a year had normal thyroid function, meaning they didn't require any tablets, and around 15% continued to have an overactive thyroid and therefore required either a repeat dose of radioiodine or had to restart their antithyroid tablets. Radioiodine can cause worsening of thyroid eye disease and is typically avoided in people with moderate or severe eye disease. Those with mild eye disease are sometimes given a short course of steroid tablets called prednisolone, which can significantly reduce the risk of eye problems worsening or developing. There can be a short-term increase in thyroid hormone levels following radioiodine, so in some situations we may recommend tablets such as beta blockers around this time. Any extra exposure to additional radiation is likely to carry a very small increased risk of cancer, but no studies have ever shown convincing evidence of radioiodine increasing the cancer risk. Any small risk is likely to be outweighed by the benefits of controlling overactive thyroid. Although many people fear significant weight gain after radioiodine, most evidence suggests this is no more likely than with other th treatment options, particularly if we are able to avoid very low thyroid hormone levels developing after treatment. This can be achieved by regularly checking thyroid function tests in the weeks after treatment. Another approach is to start replacing thyroid hormone to prevent the effects of developing an underactive thyroid, whilst at the same time giving carbimazole to block the effects of any persisting overactive thyroid, and this is called a block and replace regimen. 
There are strict guidelines in place to limit other people being exposed to excessive amounts of radioactivity from radioiodine. The list in this slide is taken from our information document which you would be given during the consent taking process. For the purposes of this document, close contact is defined in closer than arm's length and you can see that for the first 11 days, all close contact with children under the age of 5 is essential as well as limiting close contact to older children and adults to less than 15 minutes. For the following 10 days, there continue to be restrictions in place as detailed in the lower half of the slide. Finally, moving on to the third treatment option, surgery. Thyroid surgery involves a small incision across the front of the neck, which is done under general anaesthetic. There is a near 0% chance of recurrent overactive thyroid, but there is always a need for levothyroxine, thyroid hormone tablets after this treatment. Complications are rare but include low calcium levels in less than 2% of people, and this can require treatment with tablets. Damage to the nerves which control the voice box occur in less than 1%, but this can change the quality of speech. The surgery itself leaves a small scar in the neck and as with any operation involving a general anaesthetic, there are some small risks associated with this. If you were considering thyroid surgery, the procedure, including its risks, would be discussed in much greater detail with your surgeon. So to summarise the treatment options, none of the treatment options are perfect, but patient satisfaction tends to be quite high after all three treatments. In a Swedish survey from the 1990s, radioiodine was recommended by 84% of patients who'd received it, surgery 74% and tablets 68%. More recently in Edinburgh we surveyed our radioiodine patients and found that 79% would recommend the treatment to a friend and the average satisfaction score was 8.5 out of 10 where 1 was not satisfied and 10 was very satisfied. The pros of radioiodine include a high likelihood of permanent cure, which is particularly important to avoid future overactive thyroid in older people and those at risk of cardiovascular disease. It also avoids thyroid drugs in pregnancy in the future, it avoids the risk of surgery and medication side effects, and all hospital clinic visits can stop once overactive thyroid is cured. The cons of radioiodine include the high likelihood of requiring lifelong levothyroxine tablets, a potential risk of worsening eye disease, and the need to observe the radiation safety guidelines, which can be difficult for people with young children and, as mentioned previously, is not suitable in pregnancy or within six months of contemplating pregnancy. Moving on to tablets, the pros include quick control of thyroid hormone levels and also avoiding the risks of surgery and the contact restrictions with radioiodine. There's also some chance of coming off all medication later on, although as mentioned earlier on this depends on the TRAB antibody levels. The downsides of tablets include the small risk of serious medication side effects, the low likelihood of a prolonged remission in most people, and also the increased risk of birth defects if given when pregnant. With surgery, the pros are quick control of thyroid hormone levels and a near 100% permanent cure rate. It also avoids the risks of worsening eye disease associated with radioiodine, as well as the contact restrictions associated with radioiodine. Surgery also avoids the risks of medication side effects and hospital visits can stop once the overactive thyroid is cured by surgery. The downsides of surgery include the need for lifelong levothyroxine tablets, the risks associated with the general anaesthetic and the small risk of surgical complications. Returning to the summary slide, definitive therapies such as radioiodine and surgery have a high chance of requiring lifelong thyroxine replacement, but a low risk of ever developing an overactive thyroid in future, whereas the medications such as carbimazole and PTU offer a small possibility of coming off medication, but a large risk over time of developing an overactive thyroid again. 
To summarise, uncontrolled overactive thyroid can have serious health consequences, but it is a curable condition. The right treatment is different for every patient, and this is a decision to make with your endocrinologist. If you are a cigarette smoker, it's hugely important to aim to stop smoking, as it has an impact both on the risk of treatments being effective and also the risk of thyroid eye disease. We'd strongly recommend you discuss your treatment options with your clinic doctor in some detail and if you have any further questions the British Thyroid Foundation website has a number of useful information sources.